Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 17th. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing, making beer at home. Well, this week we talked to our friend Bob Hansen from Brees Malton Ingredients Company about brewing with malt extracts and some tips for doing that. Also, we talked to Chris Colby, editor of Brew Your Own Magazine, about his picks for the 10 hardest beers to brew at home. We've got a lot on tap today, so let's take a quick sprint through the mailbag. I think we uh, mentioned last week that uh, we're getting more mail now that I can uh, practically read on the show every week, but I do answer every message that I get, and I do appreciate every message that I get. So if you have a question or a comment, please send it to james at basicbrewing.com or use the contact form on basicbrewing.com and say it with me, please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Okay. If you uh, remember last week, Eric from Greenville, South Carolina, wrote in to say he brewed a medieval-style beer without hops known as a gruet, and it came out sour, very sour. One of the questions he had about fixing his uh, overly sour beer was whether he could boil pumpkin pie filling and add it to his uh, beer to mellow it out. Well, Evan from Knoxville, Tennessee, weighed in, saying he'd recommend using raw pumpkin pie pumpkin instead of the canned stuff. Evan brews with pumpkin by cutting it into large chunks, discarding the seeds and other innards, and uh, including it in his uh, boil. He says it imparts just the right flavor, and it was pretty easy to remove from the wort and didn't add a lot of excess trube. Well, Andrew wrote in and said uh, he's an Australian living in Edinburgh, Scotland. Andrew had his first go at brewing recently, a brown ale, using pale malt extract and chocolate specialty malt. But he said he was uh, shooting for a specific gravity of 1.040, or 1040, to uh, 1044, and only got a 1034. He asked, is there a way to fix this by throwing in more extract or sugar? Well, you can increase the gravity of a beer once it's in the fermenter by boiling more extract in a small volume of water for 10 or 15 minutes to sterilize it, then cool it to pitching temperature uh, before adding it to your wort. However, I asked Andrew to take another hydrometer reading and to take the temperature of the wort in the hydrometer. Uh, Temperature affects your hydrometer reading because hydrometers are calibrated to be accurate at a certain temperature, and I believe most are calibrated to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what mine is. If the wort or beer is warmer than that, you'll get a lower gravity reading on the uh, floating scale because the little bobber will uh, sink lower in the liquid. So, after referring to an online gravity correction calculator, which you can find through Google uh, by searching for a gravity correction calculator, Andrew found his wort to be a little higher in gravity, 1.036 or 1036. End of the story, Andrew decided to uh, just take Charlie Papazian's advice to relax and have a homebrew. Of course, since this was Andrew's first batch, he had to fall back on a store-bought beer, though. On another note, Andrew said that he wasn't happy with the quality of uh, the hopped extract kits that his local homebrew store sold, and he asked if there was a way to fix these so that they tasted better. Well, my advice was to find a source for good ingredients and start with those. In my opinion, it's better to use only ingredients you're happy with rather than to try to uh, cover it up with something that's substandard. Wayne from Lansdale, Pennsylvania had another good suggestion. He uh, asked about using a turkey fryer for brewing beer outside and wondered if there were concerns about contamination by brewing outside and whether the high heat of the propane burner would be detrimental to the brew. Well, first of all, I brew outside all the time now with a brew pot on a propane burner And I love it. You don't have to worry about contamination during the boil because the heat of the wort will instantly kill any wild yeasts or bacteria that happen to fall in there. You might want to watch out for any leaves or, you know, other stuff that might fall in there, bugs, whatever. Uh, But, you know, I also love the speed at which I'm able to come up to boil and uh, to the other temperatures that I'm trying to hit for strike water and so forth in all-grain brewing. However, with the higher power of the propane burner, You want to make sure you stir your extracts into the water very well, especially liquid extracts, so that they don't sink to the bottom and get scorched by the high heat. So make sure they're dissolved well 
in there in the water when you're adding them. And you don't need a very violent boil to brew. So you want to watch your heat to get a vigorous boil, but not one that's over the top, so to speak. My concern with the turkey fryer is not with brewing outside. It's with the design of the pot and the burner. Now, some of the turkey fryers are very tall and skinny, and they could tip easily. So you want to pick one that appears stable to you. You know, it just gives me chills to think of seven gallons of boiling wort tipping over and scalding a youngster or any of you guys, you know, for that matter. So be very careful. And my, my propane burner was designed to go under a converted keg, so it's it's very stable and relatively low to the ground. But still, you know, I've backed into it and gotten a nice little burn on my calf before, so, <laughs> so you, you still have to be careful. By the way, I want to thank Wayne for his winter warmer recipe that he submitted to our recipe database on basicbrewing.com. You have to check that out. It looks delicious. And if you have extract recipes you want to share... I'd be grateful if you'd submit them to our database at basicbrewing.com. Bill from Virginia Beach wrote in with an equipment tip. Bill says he uses a 24-inch wallpaper pan that he got at Home Depot to sanitize his racking canes and tubing. That's a very handy tip. You can just lay them in there and be sure they get all covered at once with the uh, sanitizer. Dan from New Jersey writes in to ask what I think about using maltodextrin to add body to beer. I say if you want to get more body or mouthfeel to your beer, uh, maltodextrin is a good way to do that. In fact, there is a recipe for amber ale on our basicbrewing.com site that uses half a pound of maltodextrin to add body. Uh, By the way, maltodextrin is an unfermentable sugar uh, that uh, the yeast doesn't eat, so it gets to stick around and add character to the beer. I want to thank Andy in Chicago for suggesting that we change the way we name our episodes so that they uh, show up better on iPods, and I'm instituting that change this week. And finally, I want to welcome a new beer podcast to the world. Pacific Brew News Radio is dedicated to brewers and beers from the West Coast. You can join Rick and Mark each week for beer news and reviews from that part of the country by going to pacificbrewnews.com. And they uh, also have a good section on their site dedicated to homebrewing, where they have listings of homebrew clubs, shops, and events in that part of the country. So check them out, pacificbrewnews.com. Well, now on to our first interview. Chris Colby is the editor of Brew Your Own magazine, and in the December issue, which is out now, Chris compiles a list of 10 of the hardest beers to brew at home. We talked to Chris about the article. It's basically a recipe collection. We've got a recipe for each and then a short discussion, um, you know, to try to help a brewer understand, like, you know, what are the bumps in the road they're going to encounter and, you know, hopefully uh, give them some tips to overcome them. Well, let's get started, uh, shall we? The first on the list is uh, wit beer. Yeah, uh, wit beers, wit means white, and these are, you know, very pale beers. Uh, They've got a lot of turbidity, you know, they're cloudy, they're spiced. And, you know, they're typically brewed with a Belgian yeast that gives, you know, a nice sort of zingy character to it. And uh, so interesting style for home brewers, but um, it can present some problems. Probably the biggest one is just getting the the level of spices right. When you brew a beer and, you know, you add the hops, the hops come with a little rating of, you know, their alpha acid percentage to tell you how strong they are. But, you know, spices don't. They just, you know, you buy coriander and it's, coriander and you don't know if it's particularly strong weak or whatever and you so you just have to sort of brew uh, your batch and and see what happens and so like the the big suggestion in here we put for, for spicing is to aim sort of low a little lower than you think then taste the beer and if you need any more uh you know a little bit extra spice character you can just add it uh directly to your keg you can just sort of like dry hop it with uh spices I see. And it and it would be a lot easier to add more spices than to take them out. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, to to take out spices you'd have to brew uh you know a second batch unspiced or or very lightly spiced and then blend it in, which is actually another way you can do it if you, you know, if you brew like lots and lots of beer. But yeah, it's you can't take out spices out of a single batch. And what about the haziness? How do you go about uh, you know most most recipes or most beers you're trying to to 
get a clear beer and not to go for the haziness. Right. With a with a wit beer, you could go against the grain a little bit there. The big key uh, is you use some wheat in the formulation. And um, in this recipe, we even use some, some flaked wheat, which is an unmalted wheat. And then, of course, when you're boiling it, you don't add uh, the Irish moss like you typically do. Irish moss is a fining agent that pulls down proteins during the boil. And, you know, the idea is to, to clarify the beer. And, of course, when you want a cloudy beer, you, you know, you don't add the, the Irish moss. Now, what about the wee heavy? That was my nickname before the uh, before I went on the Atkins diet. Uh, but uh, <laughs> tell us about the wee heavy beer. Yeah, a wee heavy is a Scottish style. Um, it's basically the heaviest of the Scottish style. It's sort of the Scottish equivalent of a uh, barley wine. And um, wee heavies are, are, are very big beers. They're very malty, but unlike other big ales. Uh, they've got a very low amount of esters in them. You know, esters are those uh, molecules that make a beer smell, you know, sort of fruity, you know, maybe banana-y. And, you know, a typical British beer is is somewhat estery, whereas Scottish beers are, are typically, they're ales, but they're very clean ales. Mm-hmm. And the big key here is you want to use the right kind of yeast strain. The, the Scottish yeast strains do a, do a good job for this style. They're, when you pitch them at the right level, when you, you know, you make a big enough yeast starter, They'll ferment clean, and also they'll drop out a little bit earlier than uh, British yeast strains will. So you get, you leave uh, some of the sugars in the wort, and, and you know you get that big chewy, uh, malty, wee heavy flavor. So you know the basic key here is uh, using the right yeast and, and pitching a lot of it. You know we recommend for uh, the five gallon batch that you make basically a four quart or four liter yeast starter, and that's you know four quarts is a gallon. Wow. So you want to you want to raise a lot of yeast to pitch to this. It yeah, is. you also want to keep the fermentation temperature uh, lower than most ales, around uh, sixty degrees. So it's so it's almost lagering the uh, the ale. Yeah, it's just about that. Number three on your list is a triple. Triple, yeah, Belgian triples, great, great beers. When you when you pour a Belgian triple out, you know it's incredibly light colored. Usually has a has a, a really big head, and you know if you didn't know what it was, you might be expecting a fairly uh, you know, light beer, and whereas the flavor of a triple is light, the it's actually very strong. You know, a lot of times it's around nine percent alcohol, and so the big, you know, the big challenge in making a good triple is to combine, you know, a very potent beer, but make make it light in color. The two basic keys for that are, are of course, you want to keep your your grain bill. You know, only use very light malts. In our recipe, we use. Uh, a combination of Pilsen malt, uh, which is very light, and a tiny little bit of Vienna, which is just a hair darker, but not, you know, it's not the dark like a crystal malt or anything. And then we also use a pretty healthy dose of uh, Belgian clear candy sugar. Mm. And all that does is up the alcohol content without adding uh, any color at all, or any body, for that matter, to the beer. Now, are there any challenges in the uh, fermentation, anything that you've got to look out for when you do add uh, that much sugar? You'll want to add, and, and we've got this in the recipe, you want to add a little bit of yeast nutrients. You know, whereas wine yeast do a very good job in a mix of a lot of simple sugars, beer, when you start getting just a lot of simple sugars and not more of the complex sugars like maltose and maltose triose, tends to do less well. So you want to give it a little bit of uh, yeast nutrients. And also, as with any big beer, uh, you, want, you want to keep your pitch rate up here. For this one, we recommended a three-quart starter of uh, Belgian Trappist yeast, and that's a good you know, yeast that will do well in a high alcohol environment. But, you know, you need to you need to pitch enough of it so that it has, you know, enough enough yeast there to do the job. Number four, you've got uh, Schwartz beer. Yeah, Schwartz beer, a really good style. Now, now, you describe a Schwartz beer is something that looks like one thing but is another. What do you mean by that? Right, a Schwartz beer, you pour it out, and, it, and it's a dark amber beer, almost not quite black. Um, the Schwartz in German means black, but... You know, it's a dark-looking beer, and so you would expect it to be, you know, have some roasty, uh, you know, caramel flavors and be sort of a, you know, taste like a dark beer. But when you try it, it tastes almost like a Pilsner. There's all, you, there's a little bit, there's a little hint of a dark grain sort of flavor to it, but it's very, very light. If you were blindfolded, you know, you'd probably think it was, you know, a Pilsner or, or maybe a Vienna Lager or something. And so the uh, the challenge with brewing a Schwartz beer is you want to make a dark beer, but you don't want to have any of that roast gr- grain flavor. You don't want to have any roastiness, any bitterness from the grains or whatever. And how we do it is how actually uh, a lot of the commercial breweries in Germany do it, 
and that's by using a, a malt color extract. The one we recommend here is called a Cinnamar, and what it is essentially, it's, it's just a super, super dark beer. It's about like 100 times darker than stout. Wow. And, yeah, it's uh, it's in- incredible. I mean, they really concentrate it down. It's fermented, too, so it's actually a beer, not, not a malt extract. Uh, and you add just a tiny amount of it to your beer, and that darkens the color but doesn't add very much flavor. It's because they, they make the, the extract from uh, debittered uh, dark grains. And uh, number five is something that may, may taste like a dark beer. It's a, it's a Rauch beer? Yeah, a Rauch beer. Um, uh, basically, uh, in German, Rauch means uh, smoke, and it's a, a beer that's made with grains or, or with malt that has been smoked, and you end up with a beer with an actual smoky character to it. The big challenge with brewing a Rauch beer is that the chemicals in smoke that make the smoky flavor are uh, belong to a class of chemicals called phenols. If you have any chlorine at all in your water, the chlorine will react with that and make uh, these funny, like, Band-Aid-y kind of tastes. So when you, when you brew a Rauch beer, what you need to do is make sure that your water is completely uh, free of chlorine. Um, the usual way brewers do this is to carbon filter their water, and that's usually enough to remove, you know, most of the, the, the chlorine from your water. For Rauch beers, though, you should really go the extra mile and, um, you know, make up your brewing liquor the night before. You know, put all your water in uh, in your kettle or in your mash tun or, or somewhere, and just add a Camden tablet to it. Uh, those are the uh, little tablets that winemakers use to sanitize their must. You know, add a Camden tablet to it. Uh, let it sit for uh, 24 hours, and you know you probably want to lightly cover the top just so stuff's not falling in your water. And uh, that the Camden tablet will the, the chemicals in there, the uh, metal bisulfite, will react with the, any remaining chlorine in your water, take that out, and then uh, it will just evaporate out of the water overnight. Now number six is a blended lambic, and you pronounce it Huza. Huza, yeah. Because it looks nothing like Huza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's spelled G U E U uh Z E, but it's or one of the the pronunciations of it is uh Huza. Basically, a, a Huza is a very very sour beer. How it's made is they uh they make a, a wheat beer and they cool it overnight in these big shallow trays called cool ships. And in the brewery, uh they never clean the room where the the cool ship is in. Hmm. So, there are are the local sort of microorganisms are just running rampant in there. And some of them, you know, settle into the uh, uh, wort and contaminate it. And then the next day they pump it over to barrels, which the barrels have also been used for these fermentations before, so they're heavily contaminated with uh, all the sort of microorganisms that go into this beer. And basically there's, early on there's an alcoholic fermentation with where brewer's yeast basically ferments most of the beer but then in the later stages, wild yeasts, particularly uh, Britannomyces and uh, lactic acid bacteria, particularly uh, Lactobacillus and Pediococcus, take over and they turn the beer from a wheat beer into a very, very sour beer. And the neat thing about uh, Huzas are that they're, they're a blend of different beers. They take beers that are three years old, uh, two years old, and beers that have, have just been brewed that year and blend them all together into this this blended sort of champagne like i mean they're usually heavily carbonated you know they're just intensely sour this is this is another style that's uh sort of an acquired taste you know either either you you know you taste it and you really like it or you know you hate it but obviously the the trick to brewing here is not there's, there's nothing difficult about it it's just that you need to plan ahead and brew you know uh, five gallons of this uh, once a year for three years in a row and then blend it together. So it's an investment of, of time more than anything. Right. You. Uh, I mean, I've got, uh, actually, there's an old uh, bathroom on the side of our house that nobody uses, and I've just got it set up as a fermentation chamber right now. There's just buckets of homebrew in there uh, <laughs> sitting, rotting, essentially, uh, for waiting for the day that I they blend the uh, blend the beer together. Number seven is an uh, Eisbach. Eisbach, yeah, another German style. And an Eisbach, you, you start with a Doppelbach, which is like a, 
a doppel is double in German. So it's a high gravity Bach beer. Making a high gravity lager is a challenge on its own. You know, um, you've got to since it's a big beer, you, you have to pitch more yeast than you do with an average strength beer. And since it's a lager, you have to pitch more yeast anyway because lagers need to have a require more yeast than ales anyway. So you start off with a beer where you, you know you need to start out and ferment, you know, with a lot, a lot of yeast. And on top of that, the second the second part of it, the ice part is once the beer is ready, you freeze it and you remove the water from it and that concentrates the beer. So you take it from, it starts out at about 7% alcohol beer and you remove about a gallon and a half of water out of uh, as ice out of the uh, five gallon batch and so you end up with about three and a half gallons of 10% alcohol beer. And you write that uh, you freeze in a beer bucket rather than a glass carboy or, or a keg. And yeah, you don't want to freeze in, in glass because, you know, it can, it can crack and that, that can cause a lot of problems. I mean, it might not, the de-ice tends to form as kind of a slush rather than a hard, you know, rock or anything. But, uh, you know, there's always a possibility if you, fr- if you freeze in glass or, or in a, you know, a stainless corny keg that you would, you would rupture it or crack it. Number eight is uh, dry stout. Yeah, dry stout. This is, I added this one. Uh, well, partially because I'm just a huge dry stout fan, and also partially because it, it's one of the one of the styles that a lot of times you hear homebrewers say that it's one of the easiest styles. I mean, the, the usual reason they give is that you know they'll say, well, it's got a lot of roast flavor in it, you know, so you basically it's going to cover up any of your mistakes. And I just sort of I don't agree with that at all. I mean, I think first of all, in a good stout, if you taste like uh, you know Guinness. Or Murphy's, or uh, what's the other one? Beamish. They, there's a very narrow window of like a roast that's acceptable in a stout. If you get too much, it's just terrible. You know, it's it's just bitter and harsh, and you know, just tears your throat out. But if you don't have enough, then it's just kind of wimpy. It gets you know, there's like a, it gets sort of that weak coffee flavor to it, mm-hmm. and you know, it's not enough to really, you know, do it flavor wise. But it's you know, it just sort of in a weird limbo where it's not really a porter and it's not really a stout and it's just not any good. The, the other difficulty is, as, as the name implies, a dry stout should be very dry. I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, if you ask them to describe Guinness, they'll say, you know, it's like a big, full, rich beer. And when you taste it, it's not. I mean, it's very, very flavorful from the roast, but it's a dry beer. I mm-hmm. mean, if you taste it, there's, there's not a lot of body to it. And, uh, you know, one of the problems that homebrewers have you know, or at least one of the most common problems that homebrewers have is getting their beers to attenuate properly. You know, if you read the online uh, forums, people are always saying, you know, oh, my, my beer quit early, what do I do? You know, so you definitely need to make a very fermentable wort for your uh, dry stout, and you need to, you know, pitch enough yeast that you uh, can get it to ferment out. Number nine is uh, Berliner Weiss. Yeah, Berliner Weiss. Uh, this is another sour beer. I, I put two sour beers on the list because I really like sour beers. Berliner Weiss was a beer that uh, Napoleon called uh, the Champagne of the North. And what it is, it's a light wheat beer, but it's very, very sour. Maybe not quite as sour as a Lambic, but, you know, it's noticeably sour. A lot of times it's served with a, with a sugar syrup with it. There's raspberry syrup is sometimes added, hmm. or there's a green syrup called a Woodruff syrup that's added the, the traditional glass for it is this big goblet, and if you see people drinking it, you know, they've either got like a red or a green beer in their hand. Huh. It's fairly difficult to brew because it's a, it's a low-gravity beer, and so basically in order for it to keep well, you need to sour it quickly. You know, with a, uh, with a Lambic, you have a little bit more leisurely time schedule to, to sour the beer over because it's going to have enough alcohol to act as a preservative. But in a Berliner Weiss, I mean, the starting gravity on these things is like, you know, around 1.030 specific gravity. So it's very low. You know, it only ends up with about 3% alcohol in it. So what you need to do is you need to make an actual, uh, you know, starter for your bacteria. Hmm. And the bacteria you use for this is lactobacillus. It's unlike a uh, lambic that's soured with just, you know, a variety of microorganisms, including both yeasts and bacteria. Uh, Berliner Weiss is soured with one single strain of bacteria, and that's a, a lactobacillus strain. So we recommend that you make about a quart starter, and 
because lactobacillus grows very slowly, you need to plan ahead and make your starter like a week or two ahead of time. And for best results, you don't want to you don't want to aerate the lactobacillus starter because it's an anaerobic bacteria. It doesn't. Oh. Uh, I mean, aerobic conditions don't kill it off, but the the yeast don't grow well, or the sorry, the bacteria don't grow well under those conditions. So you don't want to aerate the the bacterial starter, and you want to keep it somewhere fairly warm, between 70 and 80, if not higher. Then basically, you just make the 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 weak wheat beer to start, pitch your yeast and the bacteria at the same time, and just sort of hope. The one thing with bacterial fermentations is they're not always as quite as ordered as uh, you know beer fermentations are. When you pitch a, a you know a proven beer yeast, if you pitch enough uh, yeast cells, the fermentation is going to go you know in a fairly orderly manner. You know what's going to happen with bacteria. Sometimes sometimes things turn out well. Sometimes not so well. And then number uh, number ten is is uh, one that uh, comes with a question, and it's American Pilsner. And the question that a lot of pe- people may be asking is why? Why would you? <laughs> <laughs> why would you brew an American Why would you Pilsner? brew an American Pilsner? Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's a good question. Why? You know, we'll leave to to the individual home brewer if if he wants to brew it or not. I mean, certainly you can go to any store in America and buy American Pilsners for really cheap, but as a you know as a brewing challenge american pilsner is basically the challenge in it is that it's virtually flavorless but it's also a, it's also completely flawless mm-hmm. i mean if you taste like you know budweiser or miller or coors you know i mean if if you can taste them <laughs> uh, you know they're clean there's no you know there's no odd off aromas there's no weird flavors poking at you they're just you know, they're almost like a blank slate. You know, at least until you try Michelob Ultra, and then suddenly an American Pilsner tastes like it's you know wonderfully flavorful. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you know the the big key to brewing an American Pilsner is you just have to be you know on your game in in all respects. You know, you have to clean well, you have to uh, you know ferment well, and just you know use fresh ingredients. Basically, you know. Every, everything you need to do for other styles, but just more so. And and then hire a giant marketing team. Yeah, yeah. Get some, <laughs> get some. Uh, one of those Clydesdales. Yeah, get some Clydesdales, <laughs> and maybe a talking dog or something. <laughs> well, there you go. The the ten uh, most difficult. What is it? The ten most difficult uh, beers to brew. Yeah, yeah. We call. I think we call it ten hardest styles. Well, very good, Chris Colby. Uh, editor of Brew Your Own, I, I sure appreciate your time and advice. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for interviewing me. It was fun. You can read Chris's article along with recipes for each one of those beers we talked about in the December issue of Brew Your Own. And if you click on the BYO banner on basicbrewingradio.com, you can get the issue for free. And if you decide to subscribe after reading that free issue, you'll be helping to support this podcast. And speaking of supporting this podcast, I want to thank those of you who have ordered your Basic Brewing Radio t-shirt. They're good shirts. They're cheap, and they'll help spread the word about uh, BBR. You can see them at uh, basicbrewingradio.com, and uh, I'm hoping we'll get pictures of you wearing your BBR shirt so that we can build a little gallery of our friends out there on the site. Well, now, I've uh, gotten quite a bit of positive feedback from our earlier shows featuring our friend Bob Hansen with Brees Malton Ingredients Company. Before, Bob talked about the uh, malting process and how malt extract is made. Well, now Bob joins us to give us some tips on getting the most out of an extract brew. I started as a home brewer, uh, of course, brewing with uh, malt extract uh, because it was easy and convenient and get bit by the brewing bug and uh, got a job at a brew pub as a brewer. And that brew pub uh, was a, a 10-barrel system, and it was uh, set up to be a malt extract brewery. So it did not have a louder ton, uh, per se. Um, after becoming uh, the brewmaster there and uh, formulating all the uh, beers, uh, I got extensive experience making all different beer styles with malt extract and got a real understanding of the... Uh, advantages and also limitations of brewing with it. Um, this was during the 
uh, late 80s, early 90s, when, uh, you know, in the beginning of that time, craft brew beer wasn't probably held to the same quality parameters it is now. It was mostly different colors of the same beer. Uh, but uh, through that period, of course, you know, everyone demanded hoppier pale ales and authentic Weiss beers, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to uh, uh, spend my time uh, brewing all those different styles with malt extract. Uh, after working there for a while, the restaurant was very successful. We expanded and introduced an all-grain brewery, a 15-barrel brewery, and we had to make the beer taste the same between both breweries, even though one was set up for all-grain, one was set up with extract. And then we expanded further um, and took the recipes that we originally made with malt extract to a 150-barrel contract brewery and brewed those all-grain there. Um, so I got to see uh, many different formulations made uh, side by side with extract and uh, all grain. And then uh, in about 2001, I came to Brees uh, Industries here, where I commissioned their 500 barrel uh, brew house, which is the front end of their uh, malt extract producing uh, line. And we make brewing grade malt extracts here with a, a fully automated uh, dream system, a 500 barrel uh, multi vessel system. So I've seen uh, everything from the production end of the malt extract all the way through to brewing at commercial scale and home brewing. So you mentioned the word limitations. What what are the limitations with uh, working with malt extract? Well, I would say genuinely uh, there's two uh, real limitations. Um, the one that I think most home brewers run up against is um, the fact that the liquid malt extracts age. And uh, so getting fresh and good quality ingredient uh, is, a, is a challenge. And we can talk about that a little bit more later. The other challenge, I think, is that um, the malt extract uh, is already set in how it's made, in that especially if you're buying a pre-hopped malt extract, um, the brewmaster who formulated that, and a lot of these are you know, formulated by brewmasters, he set the hopping level or at least the level of hopping to gravity is fixed in that wort, and he also set the specialty malts that are used, uh, or regular malts, so that, for example, if you wanted to brew a porter and you um, you didn't like having roasted barley in your porter and you just purchased an off-the-shelf extract, if the brewmaster who formulated that had roasted barley in it, you'd already have it in your formulation. So I think genuinely uh, the only true uh, disadvantage or uh, uh, difficulty in working with extract is that the wort has basically been manufactured by somebody else. So they've chosen the ingredients. But uh, that's also one of the benefits of malt extract, of course, is that you don't have to deal with the headaches of producing the wort. I was going to say, if you find a malt extract that is formulated uh, to your taste, then that's to your benefit. Oh, very much so. And uh, I can honestly say, uh, you know, having brewed in breweries of many different sizes, um, that uh, if I were in a small brewery, uh, there are certain beer styles, uh, given the experience I have with a variety of extracts, that I would produce with extract just because I can make exactly the quality of beer I want uh, which with much, much less work and uh, uh, inherent cost as well. I would assume that those would be uh, more robust styles, that's that's actually not the case. Um, the ones that I've found were, were the easiest are um, things like a, a, just a straight Hefeweizen, hmm. like a German Hefeweizen can be made uh, very well just by using straight um, wheat malt extract uh, from a variety of manufacturers and uh, some hops and the you know correct choice of yeast, often uh, something from White Labs or Y yeast like the Weinstoffen strain. And with a very simple, elegant, or a simple recipe, you can make a, a fantastic uh, Weiss beer, and you avoid having to deal with wheat malt in your lauter ton. And which which can be a problem uh, for those who haven't uh, done an all-grain batch. The wheat tends to get a bit sticky, and if it, if you've got a malt extract and the uh, uh, the extract brewer has already uh, or extract producer has already dealt with the the sparging and loudering prog- problems, then uh, you don't have to deal with that yourself. That's that's exactly correct. The wheat malt does not have a hull, and uh, oftentimes it thus does not form a real permeable bed. Uh, that plus its you know high protein level makes it very gummy and hard to separate in lauter tons. 
Uh, our lauder ton, of course, is uh, we have a fully automated raking process and differential control, so we've got you know the best uh, brewery design that you can have, and we deal with that difficulty here. And then, you know, as a small brewery, you, you don't have to. Uh, and some of the light styles, um, ones that can be made straight from malt extract, are actually some of the easier ones. I, uh, pale ale can be done very well, oftentimes by just steeping in a little bit of caramel malt with your base malt extract, and then, um, let's face it, that beer is mostly about uh, hopping, mm-hmm. and the malt character, I would say, is almost secondary. Uh, but you can get good malt character and color and flavor just by steeping in a little uh, specialty grain along with your base malt extract. Then the rest of it comes down to yeast choice and uh, hopping. And one of the one of the criticisms I've heard about uh, extract brewing is that you can't get a good light beer or light colored beer from an extract brew but i think i think it goes back to our uh a conversation on an earlier podcast where you were talking about the darkening effects of uh the aging of especially liquid uh malt extracts if it's not stored properly yeah that's the main reason behind it uh really it comes down to choosing uh, a very and finding a supply of very light malt extract it's of course best just as we discussed in the prior podcast, to use dry extracts because they don't darken over time. And that darkening in liquid extracts can be significant, um, especially when you're trying to make a very light beer that's maybe too love a bond. Um, to try to do that with an extract, you really, in a liquid form, you really need to get stuff that's uh, been treated very well or is very fresh. Our, um, the brewery I used to work at, uh, Water Street Brewery, I think I can say that, in Milwaukee, uh, we had our two most popular styles of beer were our honey lager light and our Weiss beer. And both those were made uh, on a regular basis with 100% malt extract. However, uh, we had, because of the volume we purchased, we would get our extract fresh from the manufacturer. Um, and oftentimes when we got it, it was less than two weeks old. And we used it right away. So that, that can be our first tip for the extract home brewer Buy your buy either dry or make sure that uh, your liquid malt extract is very fresh. That's that would be my number one tip. Because um, in addition to the uh, color effects that you get when malt extract darkens uh, due to time, you also get some off flavors, and that's the much associated or much talked about extract twang. People will talk about extract beers having a certain taste or character. Uh, molassesy or licorice uh, that they can taste and distinguish. And that, that is absolutely true if you're using old extract, uh, of l- old liquid extract. The dry extract, as I mentioned, or fresh extract, does not have any of those uh, defects. You can imagine here in our brew house, if you, you know, if you could get your extract brewery fresh, you could come here and take it. Basically, it comes out of our uh, louder ton and uh, through our kettle and then our whirlpool tank, but then it goes straight through an evaporator. And if you could take that fresh, you'd see that it tastes exactly the same as the wort on the other side of the wall. And and how would you describe the off flavors that you'd get from a from an, an a poorly aged uh, liquid extract? They're oftentimes more like a, a, a weird sweetness, almost like a molasses type flavor, or a, a, like a licorice type flavor. So that 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 is not necessarily uh, something that you would want. <laughs> no, uh, you know, if, maybe if you're trying to duplicate old peculiar or something like that, um, you know, it could work in certain beer styles. You mentioned uh, dark beer styles before too. Those are uh, robust styles. Are actually those are the ones that can often hide flavor defects. Mm. Um, if you had an old extract and you threw uh, roasted barley on top of it, the roasted barley will cover up almost any brewing defect. That's why it's you know, stouts are always the safest choice when you go to an unknown brewery because they're hard to hard to mess up because of the strength of the flavor compounds. And the real key, I think, to bring stuff with malt extract is successful in ingredient choice. And uh, malt extracts in general, most of the malt extract sold in, in the world is actually made for baking um, uh, or other purposes other than brewing beer. And because of that, it's those are manufactured, and we manufacture extracts for baking as well, but we do not use the same quality of ingredients, and we aren't as careful about the color development in the process, plus we don't treat them like warts. They may not go through a full kettle boil to coagulate proteins and remove them. 
Uh, they're treated more as a food product. So it's very important first when you're brewing with extract to make sure that it is a brewing grade malt extract. Make sure that the manufacturer that's making it for you is actually producing it in a brewery using you know modern louder ton or mash filter technology. Um, and then make sure that you get it uh, fresh. So we've got the best malt extract that we can find. What what are other tips that uh, that will get the most out of our extract brew? Well, um, I guess design your recipe with uh, your extract in mind. Uh, our successful beers at the uh, pub that I worked at, we started basically with just base the the normal malt extracts. That would be the lights, the golds, the wheats. And then if we wanted specialty malt characteristics, we'd pick specialty malts and steep those grains. Um, that's If you look at home brewing books, that's called the intermediate stage. That um, That way you can have whatever sort of flexibility with uh, the flavors and colors that you want, but you still don't have to spend all that time um, using the grain as a source of fermentable sugar. So you can still have a shorter brew day, uh, but get all the flavors and uh, flexible recipe that you'd want. So how would what's the best way to steep? Say I've got a grain bag and I've got some, some specialty malts in there. Uh, what are your recommendations you know, for the brew kettle as far as... Uh, temperature holding time and and all that well just in in general with grains anything containing a husk you don't want to get too much above 170 degrees uh, because you start to extract tannins now how critical is that Uh, it's not it's usually not going to kill you if it's for a short period of time Um, so but definitely you want to keep the temperatures probably below 180 if you can Um, it's important when you're steeping grains too to understand whether the grains are appropriate for steeping Certain grains are um, basically converted during their production process. These would include things like caramel malt and uh, roasted barleys and any of the dark roasted products, basically caramel chocolate, black malt. All those are non-enzymatic malts, and they don't contain any unconverted starch. So they are uh, appropriate for steeping, and you can just quickly steep them for 20 or 30 minutes uh, maybe sparge them with a little water and then ramp up your temperature and add your extract and go to boil. Um, some grains, if they contain starch, and these would be things like high-dried grains, uh, base malts that you might use for flavor, you actually have to steep them and do a mini mash. In other words, you because they have starch and they have enzymes, you'll need to convert those uh, before you ramp your wort up. And that can be done by steeping as well. However, when you do that, you need to make sure that you're agitating the bag every once in a while to get good flow of the water through it. And you need to start at lower temperatures and steep for a longer period of time, long enough at least to make sure that you're getting iodine conversion in your steeped liquid. So for, for those who aren't uh, all-grain brewers out there, uh, you would, you well, explain, how would we go about that? Well, um, you would basically... There's a couple of ways. Probably the way I would recommend to be most efficient would be to steep it in at probably about 145 degrees and maybe for about 45 minutes and then to raise the temperature up to about 155 to 158 degrees and steep it for about another half hour to 45 minutes. That will give sufficient time for the starch to gelatinize and for the enzymes to convert it. And then basically you're using your your grain bag almost like a glorified louder ton. You may get a little bit more uh, trube or particulate matter into your wort than you would using a conventional, you know, louder ton or uh, separation. But um, those are typically minor in terms of uh, affecting the flavor very much. But again, if you're if you're not using uh, a base malt in your grain bag or something with a lot of starches in it, just steeping, you know, as you come up to a temperature and taking the grain bag out at, say, 170, 180, something like that would be would, would be enough. Yes, if you're not using starchy grains. Really, the, the longer steeping, or mini mash as it's called, is really only appropriate when you're using things like a hydride malts, like Munich malts, and malts that have a, um, a white or starchy endosperm. These might include things like aromatic malts, uh, a few of the minor special roasted malts, some of the exotic malts like Marisotter, and any base malt. 
And what you're getting is you're you're converting those starches into sugars just as you would in an all grain bag. Yep, you're just using the grain bag as a as a simple uh, and maybe less effective louder tongue, um, so you don't have to worry about vorloffing and sparging and all that. Mostly, though, uh, brewers are using caramel malts, things like carapils and roasted grains in steeping, and relying on the base malt extract at, for those uh, starch converted products or those fermentable sugars. You can also use extracts to kind of kick up an all grain bo- uh, batch a, a notch or two uh, uh, if you're if you're built doing say uh, a heavier uh, or a higher gravity beer. That's true as well. In fact, uh, one of the places we sell extract to is to uh, larger micros and regional breweries that want to do a seasonal beer like a, a barley wine or a doppelbach. And they simply, you know, can't fit enough grain into their system because a lot of times these systems are designed for one particular brew size and then usually people max them out already. But then when they want to go to really big beers, they often uh, they either have to cut their, you know, the amount of beer they make in half, which they don't want to do, um, or they have to find a way to fit more grain in their louder ton or mash vessel. Well, you know, a lot of times they simply can't do that. And they'll actually purchase some of our base malt extract and add that to their wort as a supplement. So they'll formulate their recipe with the proper percentage of specialty grains and then just remove a percentage of their base malt and replace that with malt extract that they'll add to their kettle. Now, I've heard there's there's a movement kind of uh, that I've heard of, and that is uh, people who don't put the malt extract in for the full hour boil. Where do you come down on that? Um, well, it's it's definitely an option. I guess when you look at the boiling process for brewing, it um, it covers the five, I call it the five Asians of brewing. And that would be, number one would be sterilization. That's the main reason we boil our wort. The second would be isomerization. And then we need to get the bitterness out of our hops. Then you have uh, coagulation of the uh, uh, proteins that are in there and removal of those. Volatilization, which is the removal of things like DMS precursors. You know, it's important when all grain brewing to get a full kettle boil to remove those. And then finally, uh, the last one, oh, an evaporation, of course. And that is that brewers use boiling as a means to concentrate their wort to hit their final gravity. Now, a lot of those with malt extract are completely eliminated. The uh, evaporation, obviously, you can control your final gravity by boiling at home, but also by just adding more or less malt extract. Volatilization, it's volatilized completely in that it goes through a full kettle boil at the manufacturing site, plus then it goes through vacuum evaporation all the way up to 80% solids or 80 Play-Doh. So any volatiles that are in there uh, are completely removed. Uh, isomerization, you're typically, that one you need to do. So you need to do a full, full-length full boil for that, but that's not affected by adding the extract at the end. Coagulation, the all the proteins have already been removed here in our brew house, in our Whirlpool tank, so you don't need to do it to uh, coagulate them. The two reasons you do need to do it are sterilization and isomerization of the hops. So in that sense, a short 15-minute boil is probably enough to sterilize the extract, especially because it's starting with a very low micro count to begin with. And um, by doing that, what the brewer can do is shorten the amount of time that the extract will be at a high temperature and darkening, because during the boiling process, any wort, whether it's made from extract or all grain, will darken with time. So it is logical, and it does work. The amount of color development that happens during the boiling process, though, is not, I would say, huge. Um, It is, of course, exacerbated in malt extract brewing if they're doing a reduced volume brew. That is, if they're doing, say, a two-gallon brew that they add water to or a three-gallon brew because the wort is very concentrated and it darkens at a faster rate. But um, in general, the amount of color development from that 45 minutes of boiling is it's probably maybe three quarters of a degree level bond mm. that you'd save in color, maybe maybe one degree level bond in general. So it's not a huge impact. A greater impact would, of course, be had by making sure that the extract you buy is fresh or, you know, using dry extract so that it's very light. So if you're if you're doing a if you don't have a huge pot and you can't boil the the whole uh, batch of beer at once. 
you might put more weight on the decision to just add the extract at the last 15 minutes of the boil? Yeah, you might weigh it then. And, and of course, it's important to stir vigorously when you're adding the extract so that it's not... Usually what you do is you take the pot off of heat, so you're not applying direct heat, you add the extract, stir it in, that way you're not going to scorch it on the bottom, because that can happen, um, and then continue on with your boil. And you, you avoid uh, a lot of the problems that you might have with a boil over by doing it that way as well. Right, it also helps with that, because the hops, of course, have given up their oils, and are, the boil is used typically pretty easy by that point. But it's, it's a good method. You know, extract, uh, there's another method out there that says don't boil it at all. And that, um, you know, you have to, I would say, look out for that because the extract itself is not sterile. It is um, a low micro count food product. Uh, you know, typically yeast and mold is less than 10 per gram, but it's not a sterile product. Now, putting it in 180 does achieve batch pasteurization, and if you have a good yeast uh, in a high amount, it'll probably outcompete anything that's in there. But uh, in general, you can't say that it's, you're you're totally uh, free of possibilities of error or infection by doing that. It's better safe than sorry. Well, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do and still make great beer, uh, do things wrong. And I've used that means successfully, um, so I know it works. But, uh, you know, if I had a, if I had a, a large amount of yeast at high croissant that I could pitch at the right amount, you know, I, I could get by with a fermenter that's not... Um, completely clean, especially if I'm not going to repitch that yeast or bottle that beer and put it on a store shelf and expect it to last for six months. So, you know, even though sterility is key or sanitation is key in brewing, um, you know, you always get some sort of contamination. It's just a matter of being able to outcompete it. So if you're if you're hopping your own extract, you want to make sure that you boil the hops at the regular schedule. Say you're bittering hops at the at the hour. That's correct because they're their uh, ability to summarize is, is time dependent. But what what if you're using a hopped extract? Do you uh, do you are those is the isomerization already done? Yep. Before yeah. they're already isomerized and soluble, so boiling will not affect uh, the bitterness of a hop malt extract. And that's where you can get by with uh, the no boil uh, theory of extracts. Those extracts are actually pre hopped, and you just basically add them to hot water. Um, you don't need to add any hops to it unless you want to supplement the aroma hops that are in there and then uh, cool it down, add your yeast and ferment. But again, to to get the, to be safer, a boil for 15 minutes will will kill all the little, little buggies in there. That's right. That'll give you, you know, sufficient sterilization to, to have a, to be able to sleep at night and, you know, relax, don't worry, have a homebrew, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Somebody else said that. I've heard that before. So overall, what what impression would you like people to uh, replace the, the the bad thoughts or any any uh, misperceptions in their minds about uh, extract brewing? What what would you want people to think of? Well, I would say try it again and, and keep in mind the important variables of you know buying a fresh product and understand the limitations. Um, you know, I've got medals here in my office uh, from the Great American Beer Festival from extract brewed beers, and the proof uh, is in the pudding. I guess. And I, I think, you know, a lot of home brewers in general, I think they start out extract brewing, and then they, you know, get turned on to all-grain brewing or are talked into it by their shop owners who tell them it's the absolute way to go. But a lot of times, eventually, people um, get tired of the real long brew days and realize that, you know, a lot of the beer-producing process is, a manage, is a, you know, managing the hopping rate and the fermentation and the yeast choice. And they want to have uh, they want to have the ability to make more homebrew, and they want to have that time. So they'll, you know, uh, they'll dispel any fears that they have and look again at malt extract, and realize uh, now with their increased brewing knowledge, they can make pretty good beer with it. And once again, we appreciate the time and advice of Bob Hansen from Brees Malt and Ingredients Company. It's always fun to talk to Bob. And here's a bonus for sticking around this long in the show. Mark from New Milford, Connecticut, wrote in with a question about bulk malt extract. And uh, I have an answer to read from Bob. Mark writes, I noticed that some brew stores online are selling bulk malt extract. This sounds like a practical option for someone like myself who will not be buying all-grain equipment anytime soon. I find I'm more motivated when I have the ingredients on hand. 
Mark says his local homebrew shop is not so local to him. Bulk extract seems like an affordable way to achieve this, but I wonder what some of the cons might be, particularly with storage, equipment, and sanitation. And uh, here's what uh, Bob Hansen had to say in reply. Since malt extract is not sterile itself, sterile handling is not absolutely needed. Most bulk suppliers have good sanitation, and the low water activity of the malt keeps any contamination from growing. And Bob continues, there are only two cons that I'm aware of. One would be age of the extract. As with non-bulk extract, you want to make sure that you're buying from a location that is moving it so that it is fresh. Many of the bigger mail order and online stores move the product pretty quick. Bob says, my only concern would be with a store that orders a drum to save money and then takes six months or a year to dispense it. The other is blending. You want to make sure that they specify that the malt extract is all malt, if that's important to you. I've heard of uh, some places, says Bob, blending to make light products with corn syrup. As with any extract, just ask questions and demand answers to ensure that you're getting the quality that you need. Well, there you go. Another episode just jam-packed with stuff. Loads of useful goodness to help you make the best beer in the world. Next week, we start our conversation on all-grain brewing with uh, John Palmer, author of How to Brew. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And don't forget to tell us where you're from. And if you're wanting to get into home brewing while you're on our site, you can check out our DVD, Basic Brewing, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We'll walk you through the process step by step. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVD. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long. Thank you.